All right, I think we can begin. And a warm welcome to everyone who is online at this time of the day. I would like to take a quick confirmation from my colleagues in Budapest that everything is OK with the sound and the image. And then we will get started with our webinar. And two seconds, confirmation is here. So warm welcome to everyone. This is Anders Banat speaking from Brussels live on the 19th of March, uh, Thursday evening at 7 p.m. or a few minutes past 7 p.m. And uh, sorry for my uh, voice, it's a, a little flu that I have, but otherwise hopefully everything will go smooth and technology will be on our side today. So let's get started with the webcast, which is about the 2015 EPSO administrator exams, the exams which have just been announced today by the European Personal Selection Office, and we'll cover anything and everything linked to this uh, specific competition. So let me quickly navigate back to my slides, and there we go. So the webcast itself will uh, last about, about uh, one hour, and uh, we will send you all the recording and all the background information we have afterwards. So in case you miss anything, then uh, we will make sure that the recording is with you and the, pres the presentation that I'm using is also here and available for everyone. Let me do a little tweaking and twisting and turning to make sure that uh, you can see the full image that is available to you. All right, so in regarding our community, you might know the uh, online EU training community. We have about 38,400 fans on Facebook, uh, quite a robust community with uh, questions, answers, sometimes a lot of fun stuff that we share regarding EU competition and uh, a fairly high number of registered users, about 80,000 over the various uh, several years, almost a decade that we've been running this preparation service and the website. <coughs> Now, regarding the test packages, we have a very robust uh, database with many questions used. This is just uh, for the record that uh, we are trying to extrapolate information and try to pull data uh, from our database and make sure that we can convey it as best practice and good advice to all of our users and future users. So we have hundreds of hours of webinars uh, five th with over 5,000 participants trained over the years and we hope to welcome you to one of them. So with this very brief introduction, why don't we take a look at today's agenda? What are we going to cover in this roughly 60 or so minutes of today's webcast? Well, we're going to look first at uh, what it takes, uh, what it takes the one day in the life of an EU official, what it actually takes to uh, be an EU official. And then we will move on if technology allows, to the various positions that are available as part of this competition. We will discuss the, the most important question, whether you are eligible to apply for these competitions, whether why, or not whether, but why this is a great opportunity for your career. And then we look at the, the, the various details, the technical details of the pre-selection and the intermediate tests. And already I flagged this information to everyone who may not have read the notice of competition that came out today, that the, the term intermediate test is something new and that uh, is something that was just introduced by EPSO in this very competition. We look at that, what it actually means. And then we we'll go on a few words about the assessment center without spending uh, overly much time on that, but just to mention what it is, why that is important, just to keep in mind way down the road of the EU competitions. And then we'll look at a few tips and tricks and advice of how to prepare, what's the best practice that we suggest you follow. And then in the very end, we are very happy to convey a special exclusive offer to everyone who is with us. Uh, it's a very special, pretty substantial discount for all of our pa packages and all of our services that are available on our website. So why don't we get started and look at the first part in terms of the place of work, where you are likely to work as a result of you successfully passing the European personal selection uh, competitions and then being recruited 
the EU institutions? Well, <clears throat> the most likely places are Brussels, Luxembourg, and very unlikely places, Strasbourg, despite the European Parliament having its headquarters there. Officially, its seat is over there. But the vast majority, roughly 80% of EU staff, actually works in Brussels. Uh, around 10-15% of the staff works in Luxembourg. And the rest works not so much in Strasbourg, but around the world, uh, both in EU member states, at the EU representations, and outside the EU, at the European uh, External Action Service uh, supervised delegations. So the place of work in most cases, and especially for this competition, will be Brussels. Now, the selection and the recruitment, these are two separate terms. And EPSO is, as the name suggests, is a personal selection office. They're not recruiting themselves. The recruitment actually happens by one of the EU institutions, such as European Commission, Council of Ministers, Court of Auditors, uh, Court of Justice, Parliament, Committee of Regions, Economic Social Committee. They are the ones who are actually hiring people. But the, the process, the competition through which eligible, recruitable candidates can be placed on a reserve list from which they can be re actually recruited, so that process is taken care of by EPSO. So they are selecting, but they are not recruiting. Their ultimate goal is that you to place the, the successful candidates on a so-called reserve list. So the actual recruitment, therefore, is decided at the moment of recruitment. So you wouldn't know whether you're going to work for the European Commission. It's likely you will, but you wouldn't know that in advance. And the reason I'm saying you're, it's likely that you will work for the Commission is because the Commission is the largest employer given, the, given its role in the EU institutional hierarchy it's, it has a staff of roughly 30,000 uh, people, so the Commission is a very substantial uh, and important employer from among the institutions. So, going further, looking at the different positions that are available. And as you see on the screen, actually there are two competitions. And the one that I'm talking about today is the one on the left side, because that's the one that has just been announced for administrators, the AD competition. Whereas for the audit, there's an audit competition coming up, uh, but that's only going to be announced next week. So uh, in one week time, we will know all the details of that competition. So I will flag a couple pieces of information that we consider likely but we don't know yet for sure until we have seen the notice of competition. But these are two competitions. So if you happen to have a financial or specifically audit background in your education, then you are pretty likely to be eligible for the audit competition as well. And uh, the general rule is that apply for as many competitions as you are eligible for, because it's very rare and it's very exceptional that EPSO would forbid you from applying to two competitions at the same time. It usually only happens if one competition has two sub-profiles. Like for instance, if the current administrator competition had a sub-profile for public administrators and economists. It doesn't. So there's no exclusion. You can apply for as many competitions as you like and if you're eligible because you meet the formal criteria of the given competition, you are more than encouraged to do so because that obviously increases your chances. And the more specialist a certain competition is, meaning audit is far more specialized and targeted than an administrator competition, that your chances are, are slightly higher because fewer people will simply have those qualifications than the generalist competitions. But having said that, uh, let's look at quickly the deadline, 21st of April. So for the, the competition I'm, I'm covering extensively today is uh, the 21st of April, the deadline. And for the one that's announced next week, one week later, so 28th of April. Now, this sounds a little, little patronizing, a little uh, pedantical or pedagogical, but please do not leave your application to the last moment. Time and time again, we get emails. I personally get emails from, from readers of my book, 
or those who are using our services saying, well, I just didn't do it in time. I, I tried to apply on the 20th of April or one day before the deadline and the servers were, were, were frozen and it, the whole service was very slow and I couldn't upload my CV or I couldn't fill in a form, I couldn't submit it. It's totally uncertain whether my application actually went through. So this sort of basic mistake, don't do this. It's, it's, it's one of the very easily avoidable things. It's like putting the seatbelt on your car. You, you, you don't know if that's going to save your life, but at least you did your share. So try to make sure that you actually apply in time for the competition. Now let's look at the language rules, which seem to be changing from time to time, though they're not particularly complicated. So the first language and second language, these are terms and it's a terminology, which is uh, the way how languages are being referred to. EPSO doesn't use the term mother tongue. And there's a very clear reason for that is that you may be an EU citizen, but your mother tongue may be any language of the world. So if you were brought up in uh, Dubai, maybe your mother tongue is Arabic, but that's not an EU official language. So the first language is one of the official 24 EU languages in which you are a proficient user. So again, you might be bilingual or you might speak a foreign language extremely well, fluently, perfectly, almost like a native. You are free to choose that language. And as you will see the rules in a few seconds, you might want to sort of play with this. This I'm not suggesting anything anything unethical. This is something to maximize your chances strictly within the rules and complying with all the requirements of the exam. So you can choose anything as your first language as long as you're confident in that language and almost as a mother tongue level. Because the language number two requires you to be a so-called independent user, which is not mother tongue level, but a fairly strong communication, written and oral communication skills. And this needs to be English, French, or German. And it needs to be different from language number one. The reason why that's important is because a lot of tests, especially the situational judgment test, and then later the assessment center, is going to be run in English or French or German, which means that you need to master one of these languages well enough to shine, well enough to really show your abilities and showcase what you know in those on in those exams to make sure that you are not disadvantaged by an insufficient linguistic skill. So because of this, make sure you choose the language very carefully. Citizenship, you need to be a citizen of EU 28. Obviously, you see on the photo, this is not uh, the EU 28. This is a bit broader than that. It's for the geographic Europe. But this is just to mention that one of the 28 EU member state countries, you need to have a citizenship from that. Unfortunately, non-EU citizens cannot participate. So, for instance, Norway or Iceland, those in the European Free Trade uh, Agreement or other other associated countries uh, cannot apply for this sort of permanent jobs for the EU competitions. And the number of available positions. Now, for the administrator exams, the one that I'm covering right now, there are 149 places on the reserve list. For the audit, we don't know. So when the notice of competition comes out on the 26th of March, that's when we're going to know. But this is the number which determines a lot of things, among them your chances. And if, if the number 149 looks a, bit, uh, looks a bit discouraging, it should not. And I'll tell you, not just for uh, a pep talk and not just for a sales message, but in a few moments you will see why that shouldn't bother you, at least at this stage. So this is the, the end number that they are looking at. Why this is a great opportunity, probably I don't need to preach to the converted, because most of you who are on this webinar watching it live or maybe as a recording later on would know that it is indeed a great opportunity to work for the EU, not only because the salaries are very attractive, especially for an 85 position, which uh, this current competition gives a, a job for. The basic salary, the net monthly salary is roughly 4,500 euros. So that's a, a very attractive salary for anyone even in Brussels. 
And then there are very good benefits if you are married or you, uh, in terms of health insurance, but if you have children, then they can go to European schools and there are various other added, value, added, added uh, uh, advantages to working for the European institutions. In terms of the exam phases, and we'll look at it in a little more detail, but already to flag it, that the pre-selection phase is the first step towards the exam, and I already want to mention this, and this is brand new compared to previous competitions. This is different from previous competitions that the so-called numerical and verbal reasoning tests are they not counted towards the result of the pre-selection test. So the numerical and verbal reasoning test, you only, and if this was a, a camera, there was a camera feed, you would see I'm showing the quotation marks that you only need to pass, but it's still less challenging than it used to be. So you need to pass these tests with 50% pass marks, but the end result does not count towards the final score based on which the ranking of the different competitors, yourself and your, and your friends and colleagues and others who do the exam, is counted. So the two exams which will, will, which will be considered are the abstract reasoning and the situational judgment test. But you'll see it in a bit more visual way in a few seconds. So this is the big overview that we're going to cover in the next uh, 40 or so minutes. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will send you the recording. But in the meantime, if you have any questions or something comes up and you're uncertain about, and I may not have covered until the end, feel free to send us an email. We're always happy to answer, obviously, free of charge, 24 hours a day. We always answer within 24 hours, whether it's Christmas or New Year or snows or rains, because we're happy to provide useful information to, our, to the members of our community. So feel free to send us a mail. Well, or send us a message on Facebook and we'll answer your question. So going further in terms of the eligibility. Well, eligibility is fairly straightforward for this competition because for the administrator, all you need is love. Well, all you need is a bachelor degree. So a three-year degree at an accredited university, and there are different rules that apply for equivalence if you happen to uh, receive your degree outside of the EU. That's a slightly different story, but if it's a, a, an accredited European university, a bachelor degree, a BA degree is sufficient to be eligible for this particular competition. No work experience required. And that's a big thing because you don't need to prove any sort of work experience. If you have, obviously that's not a disadvantage. That's a good thing, uh, but those who are just out of university right now are just as eligible as uh, someone who may have five or even ten years of work experience. There, it's a different uh, dilemma uh, about career choice and preferences. And then for the audit competition, it, as you see, I put uh, to be confirmed because what we are expecting to be written in the notice of competition next week the, the degree there, it needs to be relevant, so relevant to the field of audit. At least this is how they usually usually put it. So you cannot uh, apply for audit exam if you happen to be a biologist or happen to be a lawyer or happen to be uh, a, a non-related field, unless you can really prove that uh, your studies included a sufficient amount of audit uh, in that particular field. And one more thing to add when it comes to these, to these issues is that the last year student, so if you are still at university studying for your bachelor degree, as long as you get your degree until the end of July, you can still apply. So you don't even need to have your degree in your hands, but you can already apply for this particular competition. Obviously, those who already have their degrees or even work experience uh, may not be so happy for opening the, the door so wide, but, well, this is how EPSO approaches it, and it is indeed a great career opportunity for anyone fresh out of university. So, going further, let's look at the tests and the actual pre-selection exams that you need to, need to pass. And there is no big surprise there in terms of what exams you need to take, which is verbal reasoning, numerical reasoning, abstract reasoning, and situational judgment test. The way they are counted or not counted is actually what matters the most. 
And this is something we'll look at one by one. So if you look at first the verbal reasoning tests, which are essentially reading comprehension tests, in terms of how much time there is, interestingly, EPSO already made this information public uh, in the notice of competition. Well, those who are following this field, like us and many of our, our, uh, our users and customers, they would know these numbers in terms of having 10 questions and 18 minutes. This is a little bit new, but the proportions are unchanged to previous competitions. So you have, as you see, a, a little less than two minutes per question for a verbal reasoning. There's always a text passage, an extract from an EU document or extract from popular science magazine or an extract from a gossip magazine. It doesn't matter what the source is because there are, there's a question relating to that text passage with four statements. And there's only one single correct answer to answer to that question. So when it comes to outside information, that's how they confuse you because you may know something about that topic. Say it's about the Euro crisis and it's all over the news these days. So you may have read some statement from the Greek prime minister or someone from the, the German chancellor and you think you have a certain information which is not in the text. And bang, you just got the wrong answer because you confuse something that's in the text or something that you know from outside. Generalizations, they might put a very uh, broad statements, uh, general statements that all the people of France love wine. And maybe the text didn't say that, but say a certain region drinks uh, a lot of wine because it's a wine producing area of France. So a generalization might mislead you and uh, may, may get you to the wrong answer. Sometimes a possibility versus fact. So if a statement has a maybe, possibly, likely, these sort of uh, prepositions or adjectives, <coughs> in that case, the possibility versus fact comes into play and it changes the meaning. So this is another trick that they use in order to, to make sure how precise, how accurate you are in finding the correct statement. And then there are similar wordings where uh, synonyms or very similar, similar uh, expressions are being used for the same term, uh, though they don't necessarily mean exactly the same thing. So going further, numerical reasoning. Numerical reasoning, uh, many of you certainly have seen the different tables and the charts uh, that are being used. These are like in mathematics. So you would see uh, this sort of chart with uh, various pieces of information and data. In this case, there's going to be 10 questions and you have 20 minutes to, to deal with that. So two minutes per question to count and calculate and make sure everything is right and accurate. It's a lot of data, you might seem, but the most important thing is that you, you just uh, narrow down the amount of information that you are dealing with <clears throat> and making sure that you don't calculate data and pieces of information that are unnecessary. So, for instance, uh, making sure which element and which cell or which piece of information is the important one is the first crucial step to solving such mathematical riddle efficiently. So there are different skill layers that you need to apply for, for succeeding at the numerical reasoning tests. So you need to interpret the data, meaning make sure which pieces are needed. Reasoning in the sense of how do I come to the conclusion that's required of me. Then you actually do, <coughs> excuse me, you actually do an estimation. So you have an estimation of how much could it possibly be because in some cases you don't need to get the specific amount. You don't need to actually calculate, but an estimation is enough. And that might save you 10, 15 seconds, which come in very handy when, it, when you deal with the next question, which might be more difficult. And then when it comes to the abstract reasoning test, this one, is a little tricky. Tricky in the sense that in the new system, the one that was just announced today, you will have 20 questions. It used to be the case you had 10 questions, but you will have 20 questions and 20 minutes. The proportions are the same, so one minute per question, that's the same thing, but 20 questions is a bit of a challenge. And abstract reasoning, as you may recall from a few minutes ago, is the 
test whose result the scoring will count towards the final score so this is a very important one and then the way it looks is you have all sorts of so-called abstract patterns or different drawings and charts which the different parts different elements of that uh, of that drawing move rotate uh, disappear appear become inverse reverse change shapes according to a certain logic and you need to find that logic very quickly and decide which one is the next in the sequence and then we have the situational judgment test the situational judgment test or sjt is the one which is most similar to the one you see on screen i won't uh, burden you reading out the text but the idea here is that you're presented with a certain social situation a workplace situation where you need to find the most effective and the least effective course of action so this uh, one in particular is about implementing a software and getting people uh, choosing which people should should be involved in the project and then there are different approaches and from the fourth statement one is going to be terrible and one is going to be really good so you need to find which one is the most effective way forward or course of action and which one is the least effective and you have 20 questions and uh, most likely 30 minutes this is not confirmed in the notice of competition but previously this was the rule here the time is not really a problem here the situation is often challenging and it's not numerical reasoning where 2 plus 2 equals 4 so sometimes in the situational judgment test it's a judgment test so there's a tiny element of subjectivity but still, I need to defend the makers of these tests and those who created the simulations on our website. I know firsthand there's a very thorough methodology behind it and, and, and process done by psychologists dealing specifically with these issues to make sure that it's not as subjective as you may think it is. So it's not just, well, I think this should be done while someone else thinks otherwise. This is not the case. So it's, it's more structured and it's more uh, streamlined than we might think from the outside so that's the situational judgment test and this is the pre-selection so the abstract and the situational judgment these are the two tests whose score counts towards the next step so that decides whether you make the cut whether you are among the top performing candidates but you need to make sure that you pass 50% of the numerical reasoning and 50% of the verbal reasoning tests. So there it's enough to just pass, whereas for the situational judgment and the abstract, you need to pass with an amazingly good score. So this is a visual summary of what I've just said. So for the verbal, <coughs> it's uh, five points. Uh, you need to get at least five out of 10. Numerical, the same story. And for the abstract and the situational judgment, you also have the objective pass mark which is 10 and in the situational judgments case it's 24 it's not 20 but it's 24 but there in these in these two these are the ones whose score are really important so it's not enough just to pass these but pass with a very very good score so practice methodology are extremely important for these exams so that's the pre-selection now here is something new and this is something that EPSO introduced in their notice of competition uh, today which is a very interesting uh, and I think a very positive development in the administrator competitions and they, they call it intermediate test and what that means is they do the pre-selection tests pre-selection remains pre-selection as we just saw it and those with the highest score those with the highest score for the abstract reasoning and the situational judgment test can pass to the intermediate test now the intermediate test is an additional step but it's a subsequent step so it's not part of the pre-selection it's after the pre-selection and it's an e-tray exercise e-tray exercise this i took the screenshot from episode sample but we also have a large number of e-tray exercise samples with explanations on our website and we are also making uh, three maybe even five new full sets available very very soon because this is an important test and has become even more important 
since it's an intermediate test. It's another step towards the assessment center. And here you would have 15 to 20 questions, most likely 15 minutes. This is not yet confirmed, but just to give you a rough idea about the timing. And this is a kind of test where you need to process, meaning read different emails, like you see on the top part of the, of the screenshot, uh, read different emails, and then choose, again, which one is the best way forward. How would you, uh, whether you totally agree or totally disagree with a certain course of action? Do you really think that A or B or C is that a really good way forward or it's not necessarily the best way forward? So this is the E-Tray exercise. Now, this is the good news about this. And the good news is that EPSO says that around 10 to 11 times the number of people who are eventually going to be on the reserve list, that many people will be invited to the intermediate test. So that, by a rough calculation, given that there are 149 places, would mean 1,500, 1,600 candidates. So this is what makes me more optimistic and, and encourage everyone to be more optimistic. Because in the previous system, if you d failed the pre-selection, or not just failed, but you passed, but with insufficient score, only a handful of people went to the assessment center. So you didn't just need to be good, you need to be extremely good in your results. And here, putting, inserting the intermediate test here, it increases your chances because you shouldn't look at how many people are there going to be on the reserve list. What you should look at is this number, 1,500, 1,600 candidates, because you, just like in a sport preparation, you do the same thing. You're not looking at that you want to stand on, on, uh, as uh, the first place in the very end and getting the gold medal. Sure, you want to do that. But your focus is the next qualifier. Your focus is the next round of selection. And when you are preparing for the pre-selection, you say, I have one in 1,500, one in 1,500 chance of making it. And if you make it to this point, you have time to worry about the next step. So your competition your chances have massively increased by the inclusion of this particular test because this is what you have your eyes on. So 1,500, 1,600 candidates come to the intermediate test, which is an E-Tray exercise. It's a computer-based exam. As I mentioned, you can simulate that both on EPSO's websites and obviously on our site as well. And the way the scoring goes is it already connects with the concept of so-called competencies. And competencies are the ones being tested in the assessment center. So there are eight competencies that EPSO is looking to measure, to evaluate for every candidate. And uh, four of these are going to be tested in the E-Tray exercise. So analysis and problem solving, delivering quality and results, prioritizing and organizing, working with others. These are competencies and we have dedicated webinars and I've written a number of articles, uh, free tips and trips art, uh, tricks articles and also ebooks, free ebooks on our website on the role of competencies, how they are measured, uh, how to optimize your performance, a lot of, lot of advice on this topic. So feel free to look those up. But uh, this is just to say that these are so-called soft skills which are measured through specific Tasks. So the E-Tray exercise as a, as a dynamic uh, computer-based exercise is designed to measure your ability of working with others and prioritizing, etc., etc. So overall, each competency can be awarded 10 points, and therefore you can get 40 points in total. So there, there's a ranking. There's no real pass mark, or at least it's not mentioned in the notice of competition, because the point is to invite to the assessment center the top 300 or 375 to be tested, to be evaluated in the assessment center itself. So, as you see, if you make it to this point, you then focus on the E-Tray exercise. And when you pass the E-Tray exercise, that's when you go to phase number three, the assessment center. Sorry, let me go back for a second. So, essentially, you have four 
exams or four exercises in the assessment center. It's a one-day series of exercises in Brussels, exceptionally in Luxembourg, but for this competition, it's going to happen in Brussels. A case study, an oral presentation, a group exercise, and a so-called structured interview or competency-based interview. L2 refers to language 2. So this is all done in English or French or German, and it has to be different from your language 1. And the scoring in the assessment center, there you have a total of eight competencies, four of which you have already seen, and there are four others like leadership, communication, uh, and uh, various others. Each competency can be given 10 points and 80 points in total. And there is a certain pass mark. You need to get at least three points per competency and at least 50 points in total. And the way these competencies are tested are through these exercises. So let's go on for a second and, and look at what's the, the goal in all of this. Well, obviously, the goal is to be on the reserve list. So there is a certain number of places on the reserve list, something we have seen in 149. It has a validity. It's usually one year. And then there is the recruitment, the actual hiring by one of the EU institutions from that particular reserve list. And the job interview, or actually getting it, it's, this is, this is the, the final part where you are called up to the European Commission, called up to the European Parliament, called up to the Court of Auditors, and you pass a normal classic job interview with all the best advice and all the tips and tricks that I can share with you uh, for any kind of job interview, any kind of such performance uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of this kind, because you need to present yourself well, you need to argue in a certain way, you need to convince them that your profile is relevant for the job. There are lots of bits and pieces that I could share with you, and do feel free to contact me when you get to that stage. In terms of how to get the job, or actually how to, to pass the competitions, our advice is to practice for 8 to 12 weeks, because this is highly subjective and highly personal, but at least based on our statistics and the feedback we get from our several thousand users is that those who pass, they do practice for quite an extended period of time. And I always say that if I were to sit a competition now, I had done my share uh, several years ago, but if I were to do this now, I definitely would start from, from a very different point where I was when I was very much into the whole calculation, the mathematics, the, the, the algebra part of it for the numerical reasoning, or understanding certain methodology, or making sure that I can solve a question very fast. And again, I come back to my favorite sport comparison, is that everyone can run, if you're physically fit, you can run 100 meters. It's not the problem. The problem is how fast can you run 100 meters? Because others can do it much faster than you. And that's why you need practice. You need practice to improve your performance. And then preparing every day for 30 minutes or maybe prepare uh, every third day, doesn't matter, but consistently, systematically, regularly prepare for the competition. Not just a rush two weeks before the exam because that's not going to work. Learn methodology, so make sure that you know what are the shortcuts, what is the best practice, how can you quickly find those important pieces of information in the, in the chart in the numerical reasoning. Identify patterns and different moving uh, shape, shapes in the abstract reasoning, or what's the, the, the science behind situational judgment test, because that will help you perform better at the actual exam. And then persistence. Persistence, again, a sport comparison, is, is just not having a roller coaster kind of performance, that you are consistent and persistent in your preparation. And then doing lots of simulation, because when you get to the exam and when you go to the exam center, you're going to be familiar with the interface. You're going to be familiar with how the computer, the buttons work. All our interface, everything we do simulates the EPSO interface. And we take it very seriously because we want you to go to the exam 
and make sure that you don't waste a single second learning the interface or, or risk losing a single point because you're not intimately familiar with the, the, the way the computer uh, system works for the computer-based tests. So doing simulation definitely helps you a lot and helps you achieving that. Getting into the mood is just a few screenshots of our tests. Verbal reasoning, we're extremely proud to offer verbal reasoning in 12 languages and we're working on our 13th and possibly even 14th languages uh, translated and or written from scratch to make sure the quality is perfect for the verbal reasoning tests. So you can practice that hopefully in your language one. I almost said mother tongue, but then I corrected myself in time. Numerical reasoning with an on-screen calculator, something that you can see on the screen right here. Abstract reasoning with all sorts of shapes, figures, and puzzles, where language obviously is not so important, given the fact that it's about shapes. And then situational judgment tests, we have that in English and French. So you can practice these, again, modeled on the competencies and the approach that EPSO requires from all candidates. So, uh, almost coming to the end in respect of your evening on this uh, gloomy Thursday evening. So, we have different training and uh, practice packages. So, I encourage you to check those out. A lot of them are free. A lot of them uh, are, are uh, tailored for uh, beginners or those who are new to the field. So, you can practice accordingly. Uh, and then, the verbal reasoning, as you see with all the flags, we have all these languages, which personally it fascinates me to see uh, Greek or, or uh, Bulgarian uh, verbal reasoning tests, which unfortunately I cannot read, but uh, as we get the feedback from our users, they are robust. And the situational judgment test, actually we have it in German as well, I failed to mention that. And other tests are also English and French. We have lots of webinars to help you with the methodology. So usually two hour webinars, some of them are live. So we have a few live webinars coming up where you can ask questions from our tutors and our coaches. And you're very welcome to submit uh, requests or comments if you have any specific interest or any specific need. We're always on the listen, very happy to help you. And that's why we have an enormous collection of free eBooks and tips and tricks in order to help you understand the methodology and master it. And Realize your dream of getting an EU job. This is just a screenshot of the test interface, or actually when you launch a new test in the interface, we are just tweaking and adjusting it <coughs> to the new number of questions and the timing that I mentioned at the beginning of today's webcast. And then uh, if uh, you forgive me for promoting my very own book, which uh, there is one edition for the administrator exams and another one for the uh, AST, and actually the 2015 editions have just come out a couple of weeks ago. And then uh, before I close this evening, there is a special discount offer that I mentioned. There is a 19% off that we are offering for all services, webinars, any kind of product that you can imagine and you can find on our website. So it's a fascinating offer and this is not something that we do often. So make sure that you, you live up to the, to, the, to the occasion that uh, you can really get everything almost at one-fifth uh, discount. And the code is MYAD or MYAD2015. It's all small caps. Uh, and this is only valid for 48 hours. So basically until Saturday evening. So before you go out with your friends to have a nice drink on Saturday, make sure you use this very special discount offer. You're very welcome to share it with friends, colleagues, or anyone that you know is preparing for an EPSO competition or might be preparing at one point in the near future because this is valid for anyone and everyone, but only for 48 hours. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we will make sure to send you the full recording, this Prezi that I've been using uh, in the past one hour and also we're going to do a transcript of uh, my beautiful words and my wisdom within five days we try to do it a bit sooner but that's going to be available for everyone to see in the next couple of days on our own website so i thank you very much for your participation and i hope i respected your time and we stayed within the 60 minute that we set out for this information webcast 
as I said, if you have at any point a question, suggestion, or specific need or interest, something you don't understand or you are lost in the Epstone Labyrinth, we're more than happy to help you, whether me personally or a member of uh, our team who are extremely devoted and committed to the cause of helping candidates succeed and get an EU job. So this is the email address, but this is something you can also find on the website under the Contact Us menu. And lots of tips and tricks that I encourage you to read, print, share, and uh, learn from. So thank you once again for your attention. A tiny disclaimer that whatever I said is hopefully as accurate as humanly possible, but we're not EPSO. We are not the official source of information. So there might be one tiny bit of information that uh, may not have been fully accurate. So always make sure to check the official notice of competition or the official documentation. But as I said, we do spend several hours and weeks and months on understanding the process as deeply as possible. So we're trying to be as accurate as humanly possible. So thanks again for your attention. I wish you a lot of luck and a lot of success for this exciting opportunity. And as I said, your eyes should be set on this new system of pre-selection intermediate test and assessment center, which actually is very good news for everyone because it increases the chances of proceeding from the pre-selection test to subsequent parts of the competition. So thanks again for your attention. Have a lovely evening and please feel free to get in touch with us. This was Andres Banet from Brussels, 19th of March, 2015.